continue. Okay. And um, yeah, so just, oh, I think Colin just dropped, um, I don't see its video anymore, but um, okay, um, that, that that's great. And um, just before we get started, I, I would just like to say that SLC, especially Helen and I have been very excited about um, this, this, this panel. It's uh, an issue that's very um, relevant right now. Um, and, and, and just thank you so much to our distinguished panelists and moderators uh, for being here. Um, the Society for Law, Science and Technology in the American Constitution Society are pleased to welcome uh, President Lee C. Bollinger, uh, President of Columbia University, um, Katie Fallow, uh, Senior Attorney at the Knight First Amendment Institute, um, Professor Colin Stretch, uh, Professor at Columbia Law School, and former General Counsel of Facebook, and Professor Nadine Strassen, Professor at New York Law School and uh, former President of the ACLU. Um, yeah, and, 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 and we're just um, so excited to, to have you here. And then uh, we, we, we look forward to uh, a very stimulating um, this discussion. Um, yeah, and um, uh, and uh, yeah. if there's anything you want to add, I'd like to echo Long and thank all of our panelists for being here today, um, and uh, especially to Professor Strassen for agreeing to moderate um, our, our wonderful panel for us. Um, we will have approximately forty, I guess, forty minutes uh, now of of discussion with the panelists, followed by fifteen minutes of audience Q and A. So throughout the panel um, and during the Q and A. If you have questions, if you could please type them into uh, into the Q and A, and we will uh, read them to our panelists um, at the end. Um, and on that note, I can hand it over to Professor Strassen uh, to begin our discussion. Thank you so much to Long and to Helen for the great job they've done in organizing this important panel. I'm really delighted to participate in discussing these really important issues that I've constantly been speaking and writing about myself. And I know that today's wonderful panelists will greatly enhance my own understanding. Uh, before I ask the first question, I do want to say that I have a special connection to Columbia. Please notice I'm wearing Columbia blue. I also want to add it is the same blue color for New York Law School, uh, so loyalty to both tribes and not a political statement blue. Uh, but my husband, Ellie M. Noam, is a longtime professor at Columbia Business School, the founding director of the Columbia Center for uh, Information and Columbia Institute for Te uh, Technology and Information. And he has also been um, following these issues, writing and speaking about them very closely. So it all comes together. Now, it's such a broad topic. To get us started, I thought I was, would ask each panelist a question that draws upon his or her special expertise and experience. And we agreed to proceed in alphabetical order by first name. So that means Lee Bollinger goes first. Um, Lee, you are one of the country's foremost experts on the First Amendment, uh, which of course makes you one of the world's foremost experts on the First Amendment. So I joined the audience in, in welcoming your insights into the role of the First Amendment in the context that we are addressing, uh, both the internet in general and online platforms such as social media in particular. Uh, thanks, Nadine. Nadine. It's, um, you know, we have a long history going back and known each other many, many years, and it's great to be with you. Um, so, you know, the, the question of regulation of social media platforms and the misinformation campaign, disinformation campaign, spread of hate speech, uh, that, that kind of um, uh, set of concerns is really, really difficult, obviously extremely important. There are certain things that I think are critical as one approaches the uh, answer to the question or answers. Uh, I, I think the first is that in the United States, under the First Amendment, largely in the past 50 years, 
we have arrived at an interpretation of uh, First Amendment doctrine that extends extraordinary protections to speech, including false information, uh, so-called false ideas, uh, and even um, terrible speech, like uh, speech that incites hatred. And we've done this, um, of course, for a lot of different reasons. And a lot of people, including myself, have and, and you and others here on the discussion, trying to understand why we would do that, why that makes sense. But in some sense, it's built on a very simple proposition. Uh, and that is that in that very, very open and tolerant uh, marketplace of ideas, there will be plenty of room and time for counter speech to uh, play out. And we can trust that system over time better than we can trust any other system. So the question then, if you say that's where you need to start is, does the current environment of the new technology of communication change that premise? Is it so different that we need a different uh, sort of a recalibration uh, of those uh, values. I think that's an open question. I do not think it's a, a you know a decided question. I don't think it's an easy question. The thing that makes it a little more difficult, actually a lot more difficult, is that the First Amendment tradition has in it not only that set of doctrines and that premise, it also has other experiences that can lead to a, a different way of thinking, a different philosophy. And for me, the most striking is the tradition of, in the First Amendment, uh, overall tradition of regulation of broadcast media. And there we have a different set of, of uh, propositions and premises. I mean, there the concern is when some people, a small number of people, uh, acquire extraordinary control over very powerful instruments of communication, it is an appropriate role for the government to intervene, not to censor, but to make sure that the discussions that happen on uh, this technology of communication are serving the public in uh, a sense of expanding viewpoints, uh, making sure that people hear different uh, ideas and not allowing uh, a private uh, monopoly or oligopoly uh, to, uh, to set the agenda in the public forum. A unanimous Supreme Court upheld that in the late 1960s and I could uh, go on at length as um, we all could about what are the implications of that for the internet technology. Again, a very complicated question. But the key point is that within the First Amendment traditions, there are different ways of approaching this problem today. Uh, and that's where I'd like to start, Nadine. Thank you. Excellent introduction. And that brings us to Katie Fallows. Katie, uh, the last time I had the pleasure of sharing the platform with you was a couple of years ago when we engaged in a long, in-depth discussion for C-SPAN's landmark Supreme Court series uh, about a case that is now more pertinent than ever in the wake of January 6th, namely Brandenburg versus Ohio, an ACLU case, I'm proud to say, uh, about the hot topic of incitement. So for today's program, could Katie, could you please briefly summarize Brandenburg and answer two interrelated questions? Uh, first, in light of Brandenburg and other pertinent legal authorities, did Donald Trump's expression on January 6th or earlier cross the line between protected advocacy and unprotected incitement? And number two, um, even if the answer to that question were no, would Facebook and Twitter still have been justified in suspending his accounts after the January 6th attack on the Capitol? 
Uh, thanks, Nadine. Yes, I uh, remember that program uh, fondly. I think that was the 50th, that was 2019. So it was the 50th anniversary of the Brandenburg versus Ohio decision uh, from 1969. And as you are well aware, in that decision, the Supreme Court established the very narrow standard for speech that would be considered incitement that the government can proscribe or even criminally punish without violating the First Amendment. And the court in Brandenburg applied that to a member of the Ku Klux Klan in Ohio who had made a number of statements to a small group of people on a farm. And the court in sort of reversing, you know, really tightening up the standard after about 50 years of allowing states to punish, for instance, communists or socialists or uh, members of, you know, anarchists in the early 20th century for promoting abstract, abstract ideas about violence or violent overthrow of the government. And that had been uh, permitted until the Brandenburg decision where the court said, you can only punish incitement speech if you can show that the speaker intended for the speech to cause imminent violence or lawlessness, and that it was likely that imminent violence or lawlessness would um, result. So there's a temporal um, component to it. You have to really show that there's an immediacy to your actions, not just abstract or you know, long-term um, promotion of um, lawlessness. Um, and you have to show intent, and you have to show that it was you know, likely to result, that, there, that the, the the circumstances were such that violence was likely to, likely to result. And if you can show that, then the court has held that that's the sort of very rare instance where counter speech is not effective to um, addressing whatever, you know, the speech harms are. And, you know, I had litigated some cases uh, involving the Brandenburg standard where, for instance, plaintiffs in a civil lawsuit were seeking to hold um, the makers of vid violent video games or movies or books depicting violence liable for real real world violence. And, you know, we had always argued you can't, you know, make people liable for their speech, you know, if it just it will lead to, you know, bad acts by someone down the road. And when people would ask, well, what is incitement? You know, we would have said, well, the classic incitement is someone standing in front of a mob and saying, let's go attack that building or let's go attack some group of people. And until, you know, January of this year, I would have never thought that we would find ourselves in a position where the United States president came so close and maybe even crossed the line to engaging in, in incitement. Um, you know, as we are discussing here, uh, the Twitter and Facebook decided to suspend either indefinitely or permanently Trump's accounts after the January 6th event. And in some ways, they said that they were basing it on their content moderation rules that somewhat appear to track the incitement um, category under the First Amendment. Um, so the question is, would it violate, you know, would his statements either in his tweets or his social media posts or during his speech on January 6th, you know, cross the line into Brandenburg incitement? Um, thus far, there have been no prosecutions of Trump. There are two lawsuits where members of Congress have sued uh, Trump and some of his allies based on um, the argument that in their speech and actions of that day, they interfered with um, the you know, conduct of government and caused the harm to the Capitol. Um, I think that the answer about whether it violates Brandenburg, it might be a hard case to prove in part because first of all, just based on the social media posts themselves, just standing alone without being considered in the context of real, 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 yeah, real world events, um, it is hard to show that they were, you know, would ref reflect the intent to cause imminent violence. Um, there, you know, him saying, "Oh, Mike Pence needs to go there and and change the election results," or you know, "We have to fight for our rights," are probably not in themselves Brandenburg incitement. 
And even his statements in his speech of that day, on one hand, he did, did say things like, we need to fight like hell. On the other hand, that's the kind of speech that many political leaders engage in. And we generally wouldn't um, want to say that just be using that kind of imagery in and of itself would satisfy Brandenburg. Um, but that is different for whether or not he could be held liable in the courts for um, incitement is different from the decision by the social media platforms to deplatform de him. And I think in both for both Twitter and Facebook, the companies said, we are basing our decision not just on the posts themselves, but we are looking at the real world context of actually leading to violence. Um, and as a legal matter, they're certainly completely within their rights to do that. The Supreme Court has long held that the First Amendment just restrains the ability of the government to censor speech. But as private companies, Twitter and Facebook have their own First Amendment rights to decide what kind of speech they want to allow on their platforms or not. Um, and I think it's probably in that context of not being bound by the First Amendment that it does seem right that the company should look at the context in which he made his statements. Um, however, I also think that it is important for the social media companies themselves to reflect upon or uh, look at the ways in which, you know, for instance, um, Facebook has referred its decision to deplatform Trump or to suspend his account to the Facebook Oversight Board. And what, you know, we, the Knight Institute has filed a statement with the Oversight Board where we have argued that the Oversight Board should not make the decision on whether Facebook's decision to deplatform de Trump was justified without looking at the role that Facebook's own design decisions played in the events that led up to or in the in the um, in the surrounding circumstances that uh, that occurred on January 6th. Thank you. Um, so that's an excellent segue to our third panelist, uh, Colin, you were uh, general counsel of Facebook, one of three in the entire history of the company, I learned. So you have actual hands-on experience with the, the real serious practical challenges here of formulating and implementing content moderation policies. Uh, so for starters, I, I'd like to ask you this, Colin. President Trump had repeatedly violated Facebook's policies, at least going back to 2016 and perhaps even earlier. So what was it about January 6th that led Facebook to ban him? Uh, can you share any insights into the internal company discussions and decisions? Uh, well, hopefully. Um, I wasn't there at the time, but um, I, I do have some, I think, insight into perhaps how the companies were thinking about this. And, and first, let me just say thank you for including me on the panel. <clears throat> I think, um, so, so to begin with, the, the, you know, the First Amendment discussion is, I think, fascinating. I will say not top of mind to company officials dealing with a question like this, precisely for the reason um, both President Bollinger and, and Katie mentioned, which is, you know, as a as a U.S. based company, um, especially dealing with content in the U.S., the First Amendment assures you a, a significant degree of latitude in figuring out what content you want to carry and what content you want to you don't want to carry. Um, the companies have all evolved their policies over time. Uh, some have been more restrictive than others. Um, the main goal is to try to be consistent. Um, and to try to evolve the policies in a way that's going to be consistent with the mission of the company. Um, one common theme, though, among these policies has been an effort to prevent the sharing of content that leads to real world harm. Um, and that one really goes back to um, efforts to address um, uh, grooming uh, early on um, in the in the history of these companies, um, as well as dealing with uh, terrorism content and and gang related content, um, and and that really has been sort of the central effort at content moderation. There have been lots of other categories of speech that the companies have restricted in order to make the environment they provide to users more accommodating. Say nudity is a great example. 
where people, um, you know, most of these services prohibit nudity. Um, but the, the, the trying to prevent offline harm has really been a focus for these companies and they've been at it for a while. Um, and that was, in my judgment, the, the, the key point to, you know, how they were looking at this um, in the wake of January 6th. If, if you recall, it was a very unstable time. There was a tremendous amount of concern that people were standing at the ready um, to engage in violent content, conduct. And um, it was really an effort to um, sort of take the match out of the president's hands um, uh, to the extent possible um, that I think drove the companies to make the decision they did. I will say I'm quite confident no one pleased with that decision. Um, these companies do not view themselves as put on the planet to censor. Um, they do not believe that um, censoring, you know, the, the, the leader of the free world effectively, a democratically elected president um, is uh, consistent with their mission. And they also recognize acutely that deplatforming a publicly elected leader only underscores the power they have over speech. And it raises exactly the sort of concerns that President Bollinger mentioned. Is the control of these companies so extreme as to warrant essentially exceptions to general First Amendment principles around freedom of expression? Um, and will there be a very aggressive regulatory response, not just in the US, but globally? Um, that said, all those <laughs> concerns are um, minimized when you have the potential for your service being used to facilitate um, real world harm. And I think that's what generated the decisions we saw. Well, thank you so much. That really brings us full circle back to you, Lee, because um, there have been since January 6th a flourishing of proposals, including by law professors, including on your faculty, about um, how we might regulate the company's um, content moderation policies consistent with the First Amendment. And I'd like to float a couple of those by you, or perhaps you have some of your own to offer. Uh, Philip Hamburger wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in January, uh, as did Jed Rubenfeld of Yale Law School. Um, um, both of them argued that uh, we should make an exception to the usual state action doctrine uh, for non those who haven't yet studied it in this audience that the general rule that only government or so-called state actors are subject to the First Amendment, but there are a couple of exceptions. Um, the so-called public function exception, and I think what has been advocated more strongly by, by both of those professors I mentioned is the kind of entanglement where the government is inducing, um, using the carrot of Section 230 and the stick of potential regulation. You don't voluntarily self-regulate, we'll do it too to you. Um, is that a, a plausible argument? To the best of my knowledge, no court has accepted that argument. To the best of my knowledge, no litigant has even pressed that argument particularly. Um, the other proposal that has gotten to me a surprising amount of uh, very ideologically diverse support, everybody from the conservative libertarian Richard Epstein to the uh, liberal progressive Erwin Chemerinsky is uh, that we should treat these companies as uh, public utilities that are part of the critical essential infrastructure subject to common carrier regulations of fair and non-discriminatory treatment. Does either of those appeal to you, Lee, or do you have another approach you would advocate? So, um, <clears throat> I mean, in all honesty, uh, I, I don't have a position at this point. And uh, Jeff Stone of the University of Chicago Law School, and he and I have worked on um, projects for book projects for many years and, and uh, have just started one on this question. Uh, regulation of the internet uh, content and social media platforms in particular. The problems with the approaches that you outlined, uh, <laughs> I mean, there are many, but uh, if you turn uh, these companies into utilities, 
or into a public forum, which is what the uh, first one does, and the second one as a, as a matter of um, law. The first one is constitutional law. But effectively, it's the same. It's making them uh, into a utility where um, it's a first come, first serve kind of um, uh, uh, forum. You're, you then have to confront this question I raised at the beginning, which is, has, the, has this new technology, which we're only just uh, starting to live with, made bad speech, let's call it, much more effective, much more threatening to a democracy than anything we've seen before. And uh, simply opening it up to everybody who wants to speak on it is not necessarily the approach you would follow if you say the consequences of the way this technology works on the public mind, on the analysis and, and, dis and discussion of public issues, then you, you want a very different approach. That kind of thinking was very much at play when the last new technology of communication came along, which is radio and television. There was a concern that this kind of communication, visual, very visceral, uh, very um, national in its, uh, in its distribution could so adversely affect the public uh, discussion of public issues that we couldn't leave it just in private hands and we couldn't open it up on a first come first serve basis. We had to have some kind of combination of private ownership and the sensibilities that come with that and public regulation that would counter this, not for the purpose of censoring some ideas over others, but for the purpose of making sure that the discussions were full and rich and so on. Now, many people over time, especially in the 1980s, came to the point of view that that was unsuccessful and counter to the main proposition that private ownership of, uh, of speech should be unregulated. So you have, I think, what we have here is a new technology that raises these questions again in a way that makes us worried that in fact, the nature of discussions will be problematic from a democracy point of view. And you have one approach which says, we cannot let these private companies control speech. And another point of view, and censors, and censors, so we have to open it up completely. And you have another point of view, completely different, which is we cannot let these companies have this full power, either to censor, but also to put on the speech that, that, that they do. And, you know, where we land on this is going to define the next several decades. But I do not believe there is a resolution at this point that's obvious. Well, I'm with you there. I mean, the, the more I, I learn about it, the, the more ignorant I feel and the more hesitant about uh, potential unforeseen adverse consequences. I'd like to give um, Katie and Colin a chance to, res or, and, and, and Lee also, why don't I start there, all three of you to comment on anything that the other panelists have said. Uh, if not, I have plenty of other questions for you, but first I want to uh, make I'll that let presentation. Katie? Oh, yeah, I would just say, you know, I certainly share Lee's, I think, important caution uh, when we think about should we regulate speech on the internet to look at the ways that government or the public has reacted to new forms of media or communication in the past. And, you know, certainly you can see starting with um, television, movies, even going back a little further to what seems now very quaint dime store novels or, you know, penny dreadfuls that there have been all these and then video games that there was always a sense of 
that this new form of communication is is um, more harmful in a way that the old forms were not, and thus we should regulate it because we're concerned about the harm that these forms of communication cause. Um, and so I've always been, you know, personally, you know, somewhat skeptical about that. Be again, now looking at, you know, um, some of the congressional hearings in the 1960s about comic books and this concern that it was going to lead to uh, a generation of reprobates. And now that seems quaint. On the other hand, it is, it, it is, you know, you cannot deny that you know, when you look at the impact that social media company um, speech or platform speech or the internet has had recently in very real ways interfering with or potentially disrupting the democratic process or, um, you know, the use of social media to encourage ethnic violence um, in Myanmar and other places, those are real world harms. That's not just, you know, I mean, I don't know. So I have that skepticism and also share the fear about what, you know, are real serious tangible harms and, and then thinking, well, how can we address them? And I do think that when we think about this, that government regulation, and Lee already alluded to this, the fact of the matter is, is everyone's, you know, piling on to the social media companies right now, and but often from very different perspectives. So you have a group of people saying, um, social media companies are biased against conservative voices, and you should regulate in a way that they can't do that. Um, and then you have other people on the other side saying they're allowing too much hate speech or um, speech that would violate, you know, civil rights laws and things like that. And so you need to actually regulate them in the exact opposite way. Um, and I think all, first of all, in terms of just getting to a political consensus, that seems difficult. But second, a lot of these proposals then carry with them all the usual concerns you have about regulation from a First Amendment perspective. How do you define what kind of speech you should or should not be able to regulate? Is that really pragmatic to um, carry that out? And even if you're in support of one kind of regulation, can that be used against you know speakers that you would otherwise favor or people who are um, not powerful like the President of the United States? And so I don't have a clear answer. Okay. Colin? Um, yeah, just, uh, just briefly, I think, um, I agree, I agree, uh, with Katie. I don't think there's, I think, I think we can all agree. Um, <laughs> we used to joke like, in a, in these deeply divided times, at least we can all agree that it's all Facebook's fault. Um, <laughs> but there isn't, I think, uh, clarity on what problem we're trying to solve. Um, are they censoring too much, too little? Is it inconsistency with policy? What is the what is the problem we're trying to solve? And you got to identify the problem you're trying to solve before you come up with a regulatory solution. I also think it's important to think about the entire tech stack. You know, we have these um, these you know drawn out battles around net neutrality um, during the you know really through the Obama administration into the first years of the Trump administration. And they seem sort of hopelessly limited now when you think about what it what it happened with Parler, right? Parler was taken offline, right? Access to lawful content, a pillar of net neutrality, was eliminated, uh, not through anything the ISPs did, but through Amazon Web Services, which um, nobody was even talking about when we were talking about net neutrality. So you have, if you're going to have a conversation about you know, these questions of access to content and the responsibilities of technology companies, you have to look at the entire stack from the pipes all the way up. Um, my very real concern, I would say, as we go down this road, um, is that we don't take steps that would inhibit technological innovation to help address these challenges. So, you know, questions around misinformation and disinformation are incredibly pressing. Um, the solutions, in my mind, are less legislative and probably more technological. There's talk about trying to develop sort of information index, which gives you a view into the quality of the information you're seeing. That won't happen. Um, for a long time technologically anyway, um, but if the efforts to go down that road are constrained by um, regulation, we may never get there. Well, you know, building on the historical uh, background and context from other media that we've heard from all three of you, 
Uh, I have long been of, of the view that there should be no exceptionalism for, for new media. Uh, Katie, I think we can document from ancient Greek philosophers that when we made the transition from speaking to writing, that was considered uh, revolutionary and dangerous. And uh, for the younger students in the audience, I, I want to talk about, just mention the landmark case of Reno versus ACLU, which we won in 1997. And uh, the Clinton administration, Reno was Bill Clinton's attorney general, the Clinton administration was arguing along with the vast majority of members of Congress on both sides of the aisle that uh, this was a uniquely dangerous new medium that had to be relegated to the same second class First Amendment status as the broadcast media, under which I still may not quote a famous Supreme Court decision uh, when I'm on air that involves a certain four letter word. And um, so um, I, I'm very um, resistant to the notion that there's something different here. But here's an argument that I have found at least worthy of examination. And I think that's what all of us are saying. We don't have the answers, but maybe we can come up with the questions and, and, and start to explore them. And Katie, this um, goes back to the Knight submission, Knight Foundation submission uh, to Facebook that you alluded to that these companies are seem to be exercising unprecedented surveillance over um, their customers' use of, um, of not only their own platforms, but the whole internet, using that to build unprecedentedly detailed granular um, uh, portraits of us that they then use for their algorithms and artificial intelligence to curate the information that they are sending to us. I'm now paraphrasing Shoshana Zuboff and other, other critics of so-called uh, surveillance capitalism, um, that if that is factually true, and it's hard to get complete information about this, um, then that would be a negation of individual freedom of speech, which really depends on individual freedom of choice, that we users are being manipulated uh, rather than exercising our own free speech rights. So that seems to me to be a potential avenue of um, difference here that would warrant some kind of government regulation in the nature of protecting consumer privacy, consumer tra you know, transparency, and consent. Does, does anybody want to comment on that? I mean, I will just... Uh... You know, I do think that is a very important issue and, you know, in, in the sense of from a First Amendment angle that often um, when states or the federal government has tried to impose regulations that would cover uh, these companies use of data. Um, often, you know, social media companies or ISPs will argue, oh, our use of data is our own First Amendment is it is a a First Amendment right about how we're using it and how we're using it to maybe host certain speech or not. Um, and so they've challenged laws like that under the First Amendment, arguing there should be strict scrutiny uh, applied to our use of, of, you know, so basically trying to use the First Amendment to fight against government regulation and really say, I mean, under strict scrutiny, everybody always says, oh, strict scrutiny is, um, you know, strict in theory, fatal in fact. So, um, and there is actually a, you know, a recent case where Maine has a, has a law like that. And we at the Knight Institute have argued that where it requires the ISPs to get certain consent in terms of for use of, of certain of data um, to say it should be a lower standard. And basically, you know, maybe, and maybe that's not a wholesale change of First Amendment law as applies to the internet or social media platforms, but there might be instances, for instance, dealing with privacy or da use of data where you can have um, somewhat of a, of a moderation of the First Amendment standard that takes into account the different First Amendment values, not just of the speaker, meaning the company that's using the data, but of the consumer or of the listener. And so maybe it's a good chance to sort of reformulate how we look at it, but without a sort of radical change. This really shows how difficult the, the issues are with First Amendment concerns on both sides. The ACLU is uh, handling that case um, in support of the law. My friend and a longtime friend of, of, of Lee's and Columbia, Floyd Abrams, First Amendment lawyer, is on the other side. 
Now, Lee, I understand that you have a meeting soon. So uh, before yeah. you depart, and uh, are there any last words or questions you want to leave with us? So it's, um, I mean, I, I think the really good thing about this discussion is that it has elucidated just how complex this is and how, how befuddled and baffled I think we are by trying to figure out how to take what took us a century to build up in First Amendment jurisprudence and longer in terms of journalistic ethics and how to have a, a viable democracy, uh, just how this plays out in this new context. And I, I think it would be uh, naive uh, to say that um, everything here is just like it's been, or it's not uh, different in degrees that should make us uh, really concerned. I am very concerned about what I see as the spread of falsehoods, disinformation, the propaganda potential of this. I think we can't look over the past four years without reaching the judgment that we nearly fell off the cliff into an authoritarian regime, that the techniques of authoritarianism were very much at play here, and they very much involve uh, public discussion of public issues and use of the internet. The question uh, is um, the, the reforms. Um, I'm not in favor of going the route of just treating it as a utility. I'm fascinated by what Colin sort of indicates as a possible development of the technology to uh, deal with some of these issues. I'm fascinated by the trajectory that the discussions are on of greater and greater pressure for uh, some kind of uh, moderation of uh, opportunities to spread hate and disinformation. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm wondering in my own mind what you do when you see a potential major problem for a democracy, but you feel that you're in a state of some ignorance about what to do exactly about it. And the analogy, the closest analogy in my mind is the 1934 Communications Act, which said, we don't know what to do, but in the public interest convenience and necessity, we think there should be a government agency that issues regulations as we go forward and, and live with this technology. I'm not sure that's right um, for this, but at least it's in our traditions to draw on different uh, ways of approaching this problem. And thank you, could, Nadine. Thank you so much, Lee. And if I could say to younger people in the audience, not that I was alive in 1934 either, but you know, the historic period was not at all unanalogous to the one that we are living in now. Uh, there was a serious fascist movement, right? Yes, that, exactly. Thousands of people rallying for in support of Nazism in Madison Square Garden. The Ku Klux Klan was an amazingly potent political force. 50,000 strong marched uh, down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, there were race riots. There were terrorist bombings. So our democracy was 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 very fragile then too. Very yes, interesting analogy. exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, we look forward to the book. We know it might not give us answers, but it will give us more insight. Thank you very much, Nidhi. Thanks, everybody. So I'm in uh, deferring to Long and Helen. Is it time to turn over to the audience or should I keep asking questions of which I have more, the more the discussion proceeds? I think we have time for one more question if perhaps have, from you and then we can- If we have audience questions, that would be my preference to respect. Okay. But... Yeah, so we have, um, we have two questions which touch on similar subjects. Um, from, from our audience members. And that's really about the implications of uh, Facebook and Twitter's decisions to censor President Trump following the January 6th riots on um, other governments. Um, so one question touches on authoritarian governments such as China and Myanmar um, under the guise of stopping fake news, uh, censoring citizens and, and other political speech. And another touches on, um, on Uganda, the Ugandan pre presidential elections um, and in particular, the government using uh, 
American companies' decisions to censor as a pretext to crack down on protests and social media and free expression generally. So if any of you could touch on that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure this is directly responsive to the, to the question, but, but, I'll, but I'll try. The, um, you know, you saw immediately um, uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany express concern about um, the company's decision to take down um, to, to platform President Trump. And you saw in um, Jack Dorsey, who's the CEO of Twitter, his sort of public kind of ruminations on the topic um, uh, in, a, in a tweet storm he issued a day or two after, after Twitter's decision, um, you know, deep ambivalence about the decision to um, take down a, a elected, you know, an elected leader. Um, you know, I think in terms of uh, uh, other authoritarian countries, Kind of using those those decisions opportunistically, that's just the nature of the beast. Candidly, I mean, I think you see, um, you know, generally speaking, um, there are um, forces, you know, sort of anti-democratic, repressive forces who are going to use any sort of item in the news to um, advance their own cause. I, you know, I don't, I don't put a whole lot of truck in that and I don't think the companies do either. They're really just trying to make the best decisions they can um, and execute as, as efficiently as they can, which is not to say they do it perfectly. Um, you know, there's a long way to go there. I will say with Myanmar, that's been a very challenging, um, you know, topic where for years now, the, the Myanmar military has used Facebook to foment uh, commu communal violence, and it's a it's just it's terrible. Um, and the company has uh, sort of tried to chase the accounts um, that were most responsible and um, and disable them. Um, but the you know the adversaries, and recently the company just took the entire military off of Facebook, um, you know, the adversaries are pretty good at what they do. Um, and so it is, uh, uh, you know, as with any real challenge in the technological space, your adversaries keep getting better and you got to get better at detection and removal. Um, and it's not the sort of thing that you can just sort of decide to do and do it effectively because your, your adversaries are going to, um, they're going to respond and, and, and uh, so you have to, you know, act to keep up with them. Katie, did you want to add anything? Yeah, well, I would just sort of add on the um, what Colin had mentioned about um, uh, uh, what's her name, the German leader. What's her name? Miracle. Okay. Angela Merkel. <laughs> yeah, about Merkel and also um, the Russian opposition leader yeah. uh, Navalny. Both came out and were saying, you know, we think it's not a good idea of. I think they were focusing particularly on tw on Twitter for Twitter or face or other you know Facebook to deplatform a political leader. And I certainly believe that in general, I agree with um, Twitter and Facebook statements that in general they do not want to deplatform the accounts of political leaders and may even treat them more leniently for rules violation than a private individual because of the concern about allowing members of the public to hear from their leaders, to hold them to account, not out of spe you know, special solicitude for the leaders themselves, but for the ability of the public to hear them, engage with their um, representatives or you know, elected officials or dissident leaders. And also as you know, the Knight Institute argued in its case against President Trump for blocking people, that those, um, you know, uh, government run accounts can function as important public forums for political discourse. So as a general matter, we think it's good that they should that the social media platforms should generally allow those accounts to stay up and should take the least restrictive measures when they do violate a rules, you know, temporary disablement or even just more, you know, labeling or, you know, engaging in, in a kind of counter speech um, instead of permanently, you know, um, deplatforming them. Uh, of course, you know, this, you know, things like Myanmar and, you know, specifically and, uh, and January 6th here, I'm not equating them, but the kind of really um, 
you know, in real life physical violence, how do you deal with that? And in that case, as I sort of mentioned earlier, that I think it's really important for Facebook and Twitter and others to look at the role that the companies themselves played in setting the stage and to, I would assume that they would want to be given their you know, enormous power over all of this um, speech to reflect on their own role and see what they did do. You know, I, I mean, certainly Twitter and Facebook took steps to try to counteract you know, election disinformation, et cetera, but to look at what they did and to provide transparency to the public so that we can assess you know, whether those were you know, good measures, whether there's more that can be done and sort of what is the best way to operate in the public interest, even if it's not a direct regulation. I have a follow-up, but I would defer to audience questions if we have any more. Hi, um, yes, and um, this is actually a question that is directed to you, Professor Strassen, but, but, but also to Katie and Colin, I'm curious about your thoughts on this as well. Um, because I, I've read your book, um, uh, Hate and, and How We Should, um, you know, um, the, the, the way to combat hate speech is to, you know, like promote it and like, let people have um, the, the, the debates surrounding it instead of sort of you know, like pushing it down. And I think that's an interesting question from the audience about um, cancel culture and then um, as a form of social censorship. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think I, I just wanted to, to ask all of you, um, where do you think cancel culture uh, fit in as, as a form of social uh, censorship? Um, and is cancel culture sort of emerging um, as sort of an alternative to uh, legal censorship of free speech? Uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I didn't know I was going to get that question, but I happen to have written a publication about cancel culture, which is available online. And if you remind me, Wong, I'd be happy to post a link to that to anybody who's interested. Uh, another really complicated question, very similar to what we've been talking about, about the social media, because the people who are um, engaged in what we think of as cancel culture uh, are doing, and thank you for mentioning my book, which is hate, why we should resist it with free speech, not censorship. They are engaging in counter speech, right? They are exercising their own free speech rights. They are banding together with other people to exercise freedom of association. And I certainly would not want to uh, restrict that through any punitive measures. But I think what we're uh, both of these interrelated topics are showing is that the First Amendment as a, an essential bedrock of free speech is necessary, but not sufficient if we are to have meaningful, robust free speech today, right? We need to find other tools and other measures and take other steps to ensure that we have a culture of free speech that goes beyond just the negative 18th century protections that our First Amendment grants us. Do other, uh, Katie or Colin, want to comment on that interesting question? Um, I mean, I think I agree with you that it's just a complicated issue. Like on one hand, I think it's absolutely right that if people criticize someone for, um, you know, stereotypes or, you know, racist or sexist language or et cetera, that they are engaging in counter speech. And part of the sort of cultural pressure is, you know, being able to hear criticisms of your own views. And they may be very strongly held criticisms, but there might be a very good reason for that. Um, of course, like this, as in many other um, areas, there, A, there's gonna be gray area um, you know, where it's not entirely clear. And B, there's a question of what are the consequences? Is it just counter speech or is it, you know, at, at various layers of, you know, losing your job, affecting your livelihood, affecting, you know, your reputation, et cetera. So, uh, you know, in each one, you know, and, uh, and, you know, and then once again, there's also the whole thing of what is cancel culture, where meaning people often use that as a weapon to suggest that you shouldn't speak up if you are disagreeing with someone, you think someone's, you know, really engaged in harmful or offensive speech. Um, but the question is, what is the real repercussion here? Colin? I, I, I have to comment. <laughs> I, I guess I, um, 
I think the distinction you drew, if I heard you correctly, uh, between sort of legal restrictions on speech, which I tend to be extremely skeptical about, and sort of a, 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 a culture of that that exalts free speech and recognizes the value of more speech, um, and yet um, polices some boundaries is an important one. I tend to be, as I said, extremely skeptical about the efficacy of legal restrictions on speech. But that doesn't mean I want my kids saying anything that crosses their mind, right? And so um, I do think there are there are distinctions to be drawn, but the legal, the, the the what you're allowed to say, both with respect to you know what the law provides and then going back to social media, what platforms permit, to me, I think the barriers to speech should be quite, quite low um, to allow more work itself out. Um, through the through the you know the 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 medium that we have available, it it is true that survey after survey shows, uh, particularly on college campuses, but also beyond that, uh, there is such an enormous self censorship, especially about the really important issues of race and gender and all of the big social issues of our time, and people aren't afraid of the government; they're they're afraid of their peers. So. Mm -hmm. It is a really serious issue, and I thank the, the questioner. Yeah, so I'll end with this final question um, in light of the time. And um, this is about the Facebook Oversight Board. So, you know, there were many different routes Facebook could have taken. Uh, why an Oversight Board in particular? Why this composition of 20 um, largely law professors and, and lawyers in order to make these decisions? Yeah, so I'll take I'll take a stab at that. I think um, you know one of the reasons for the oversight board is is what we've been talking about, which is the First Amendment and the and therefore the limitations on government regulation of speech, right? So normally, if you're an enterprise looking for accountability, the government provides that for you. And in the U.S., uh, when it comes to speech, the government really doesn't play that role. That's unlike, for example, in Europe, where Facebook and other social media companies have a fair bit of uh, a fair bit of content regulation imposed upon them. Um, I think the Oversight Board is one of many efforts that the company is undertaking in order to increase accountability um, for the content decisions they make. Um, in terms of the precise makeup, I, I'm not sure we really have time to go into it. I would refer you to a, an article that Kate Klonick wrote in the New Yorker, I think about a month ago, that does a pretty good job of just sort of tracing the history, kind of how we got here. Katie? I, I don't have uh, anything to add. I think Colin's definitely the expert <laughs> in this, you know, um, area. But, you know, I think it's a really interesting decision. And it's certainly the first sort of experiment of having this kind of quasi judicially somewhat independent D entity. So, you know, I'm certainly interested in, you know, the decisions that are coming out of there and the level of interest, you know, um, in terms of the, the number of submissions, for instance, on the Trump deplatforming is huge. I was a, a big skeptic about whether it could do any good, but uh, quite frankly, after seeing the first six decisions, which I know is a drop in the less than a drop in the bucket, uh, but still might have big precedential impact. Of course, five of the six overturned Facebook's restrictive decisions, and every single one of them did what Facebook had said they should do, which is to enforce international human rights law standards. And they were very strictly interpreted and enforced, um, depending on a, a, a principle that's also key to American law, which Katie referred to earlier, uh, the least restrictive alternative. And the board was saying you could have done other things that were less restrictive of speech. So I'm more more hopeful than than I had been initially. On that note, um, I'd like to thank all our panelists today, including including President Bollinger, uh, Professor Strassen, um, Ms. Bello, and and Professor Stretz for for being here and having this important conversation with us today. Um, I don't want to keep you past the time, so I'm just going to end on a thank you. Thank you all so much. I really enjoyed it. And thank, thank you, you the audience as well. Thank you. Thank you. Including me. Thanks. Bye.